I never, like in the moment, because they're so connected and they're performing, I was never like, oh my God, I hope I don't screw this up. I was just, you know, you're, they were just playing the scene and I was just playing the scene. And so there was this tremendous level of home. You know, I was, I felt very much at home. I want to congratulate you on joining Star Trek. Um, was it a relief when the trailer dropped and then Terry tweeted out your character name? I think literally this, maybe even today is when I rapped uh, on the show last year. Mm, wow. Uh, a, a year ago today, which would be the 7th of February-ish, was around the time that I finished shooting uh, on the show. So I have had to sit on this for a year. And um, it was one of those experiences where, you know, I would see them rolling stuff out at Star Trek Day and I'd see them rolling stuff out at Comic-Con. And it always felt like my family's having a party that uh, I'm not at. Um, and so uh, it was absolutely uh, a relief to finally not have to, to, to bottle up something as fun and news as, as for me, as big as that um, was, uh, was a, a Herculean task. Tell me about how you how you found out about the role and like what that feeling was like. I had worked on uh, 12 Monkeys with Terry, four seasons of 12 Monkeys with Terry. So we've had a very close, uh, not only working relationship, but a, a deep friendship. We are we are cut from the same 80s kid cloth. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm one too, by the way. I think it might have been July of 2021. He said, uh, so we have, uh, we're, we're uh, writing a part for you on uh, season three of Picard. And of course, my first response is, that's awesome. I can't wait to get to see who gets to play it. Because as this town goes, you know, often, it, you know, as these things work out, you often don't end up being the guy that uh, that people say. Uh, I have I have gotten roles that were written for other other uh, actors, so mm -hmm. I know how I know how the machine works a little bit. And so I I said, look, it's an honor to at least be thought of. If it doesn't pan out, I'm so glad. Uh, I'm so glad you at least considered me for the role. But lo and behold, the man uh, is a man of his word, and August. It uh, it all went through the proper channels, and um, I was, you know, inking a contract and going to wardrobe, and uh, and then touring my bridge. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Your bridge, you you have a ship. <laughs> I have a ship. I have a ship. Yeah, and so did that's you do sort of how it rolled out? Yeah, amazing. Did yeah. You, did you do any any special Star Trek research for the role? Did you look at the movies and TV of well, previous captain? I, I, I mean, I. I I, you know, there are so many great captains from, from Kirk all the way down to, uh, uh, all the way down to Burnham. Like there's, there's just great captains, uh, along the way. Um, I grew up with, I grew up with Kirk. You can see my, my Mego Kirk action figure right there, which was my first, uh, action figures, uh, uh in 1974, my cousin Tori gave me Kirk, Spock and McCoy. So almost my introduction to, um, to science fiction entertainment was was Star Trek. So they have lived close to me my entire life. Next Generation was appointment television. Saw all of the movies. Uh, you know, I've I've watched all of the, the the new shows that have come out. So I had a pretty fair understanding initially. What I did brush up on was uh, was more specifically. Um, uh, rank and uh, chain of command and all of the ins and outs of uh, of what it means to be a member of Starfleet. I did I did dig into that, so I understood what positions were what on my bridge and uh, and who all of my crew members were. Because you want to feel that sense of uh, ownership over a role. You want to feel connected to what you're doing, and you want to understand. Uh, which department you're talking to and when. And so that's all more character research in, in terms of a, a meta sense. You know, my influences to play this character and, and many characters don't always come from uh, the thing itself, right? Like I wasn't going, I'm going to ape Patrick Stewart or 
ape uh, Shatner or ape uh, Janeway. Like I'm not, I, that was not the goal. The goal was to play this guy with his story, his circumstances, his relationships and play that as authentically and truthfully as possible. And then me as an actor, my influences come from all over the place. Um, I mean, look, I love what Anson Mount's doing on uh, on Strange New Worlds. I, my influences come from Bill Murray and Tom Hanks and, and, uh, and, you know, all those guys that Harrison Ford, all those guys that I came up with uh, that, that inspired me uh, as an actor. There is a little bit of a humorous edge to Shaw too, which I really enjoy. Um, so let's let's dig a little bit into him in episode one. Um, what I found really interesting about Shaw is that he's kind of set up as an antagonist within Starfleet to Picard, Riker, and Seven. And it's so unexpected because we always, especially in TNG, we expect Starfleet to always get along. But Shaw had like this interesting chip on his shoulder. Yeah. Starfleet gets along when Starfleet behaves like Starfleet, but Riker and Picard aren't behaving like Starfleet. And they have right. this peppered history of of breaking the rules. So, uh, so I and 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 Shaw is a very very uh, rules minded uh, captain, and that's because, as 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 you saw, and I don't want to give anything away, he his his need to preserve uh, the lives and 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 instill the safety of his crew is paramount. So he he uses the structures of Starfleet and the rules to to yes uh, captain this exploratory mission, but also we are in the final frontier. It is dangerous out there, and so we need these structures in place to keep us alive if we are going to complete our mission. And that is certainly that runs deep in him. And so when people uh, with uh, with uh, you know, higher ranks than I, of course, uh, but people like Picard and Riker uh, break those rules. It's going to cause conflict. Yeah, well, it's interesting too because as you as you mentioned, they're not behaving like Starfleet officers, which is a, which is something I'm actually writing an article about. Is that Shaw is right because I know. Riker, Riker and Picard are lying. They came aboard to hijack his ship and bamboozle and him, and he smells it miles away, <laughs> like. Oh, I don't know how profane I can be, but <laughs> don't, 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 don't bullshit a bullshitter, right? Like, <laughs> like, like he smells it. That the, There's something that stinks the minute they show up and the fact that he knows they're, they're, they're in cahoots with seven. He doesn't know what it is, but he, in, in that first scene that he sees them, he knows something's up. Yeah, he's 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 probably seen other Star Trek movies and seen captains behave like this. Yeah, he's watched a lot of Star Trek. He was there day one of Wrath of God. Yeah. Now, something else besides Riker and Picard, something else I found really interesting is that you know usually the captain picks their first officer, and it's based around the idea that they get al- that they'll get along. But Seven and Shaw like are antagonistic. They don't seem to like each other. So like, there's an interesting story there that I'm hope we get so, into. Shaw. Going back to what I said, Shaw's Shaw's goal is to keep his crew alive. Mm-hmm. And the reason I feel he chose Seven is Seven has the ability to, to be the voice that he won't allow himself to be, mm. to be more um, reckless, to be shoot from the hip so that she you don't want an, a first officer as as a, a yes man or woman right you want your first officer to be an alternate voice to, to ultimately carry out your orders of course but to be a dissenting opinion to be to maybe call you out on stuff and so shaw is smart enough to go i need someone who doesn't see things exactly the way i see them and so in spite of her uh, her uh, reckless behavior, <laughs> he kind of needs that. He kind of right. needs that voice. And so that he ultimately, she can offer up, like, we need to do this X, Y, Z uh, when they're on the bridge and question his choices so that maybe he can reconsider. And there are moments that you actually, you know, watch him reconsider and do things that that seven offers up, and it, whether he 
vocally appreciates it or not, he chose her for a reason. But that's why I'm so fascinated by this character and the way these complex relationships work on that bridge. Yeah. On the- on the Titan's bridge. Now yeah. let's talk about your first scene, the dinner scene, which, you know, we've seen little bits of in the, the infamous dinner scene. The infamous dinner scene. Cause I'm fascinated by this. It's like, as an actor, you're in costume, in uniform, sitting at a table uh, to your right. You've got Jerry Ryan, Jonathan Frakes. You've got Patrick Stewart across from you, but you're controlling the scene. What, what is that like as an actor? Well, it's just that I'm an actor and, uh, and, and the, uh, and the, the scene itself, um, is you know I, I just have to play the truth and the lines and the and the moments and the beats and have all the thoughts and moments and emotions that this character is having in the scene. Um, the fact that I was doing it with these uh, tremendously uh, storied actors uh, was a treat. Like it's a treat. You always you always want to be with people. You know I always say be the dumbest guy in the room. So I always want to be with people that raise my game. Right. That that. Uh, that can outdraw you. And so it keeps you on, on your toes. Now I was fortunate. Uh, I was fortunate that that might've been the first scene I saw. I shot. It may have been, hmm. I was fortunate that forgive the airplane. Uh, I was fortunate uh, that I had worked with Frakes. Uh, he was my director on um, burn notice uh, hmm. years before Terry was there. Uh, it, you know, so it was a very warm room. I was introduced um, as family. Uh, Frakes uh, and Terry, they they sort of primed the pump. So when I got there, uh, there wasn't that sort of awkward getting to know you, hope I do okay <laughs> feeling. I was trusted and that that trust goes far. That That feeling of people rooting for you to do your best. Now, do you have that like personal actor insecurity where you go, I, I, I do want to nail this. I do want to feel prepared. I do want to have done my homework. I do want to uh, make sure that I honor the writing and make sure that I honor my scene partners. So yeah, I, I, I never like in the moment because they're so connected and they're performing. I was never like, Oh my God, I hope I don't screw this up. I was just, you know, you're, they were just playing the scene and I was just playing the scene. And so there was this tremendous level of home. You know, I was, I felt very much at home. It's honestly, it's the, it's the heart of the first episode. That scene to me is like, you know, it's the kind of like really what sets up, sets up, uh, sets up the, the grit that makes the pearl, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. What a great way to, to phrase it. You know, and Shaw obviously has a backstory. We won't spoil, but we do find out a, a little bit more about him. Yeah. And what I really love about that dinner scene now is that when you find out Shaw's deal and you go back and watch the dinner scene, it totally tracks. It's a whole different experience because it all makes sense now. Yeah. It's, a, you, it's a, yeah. And, and hang on, there's a garbage truck. It's garbage no. day here in the Southland. <laughs> um, his story is a little heartbreaking. Yeah, it's a little heartbreaking, and, and you go from going, "This guy is an a hole," to, "Oh, I kind of get it. I kind of get it." And and they they crafted such a beautiful arc for this for this character that I, you know I just had to get out of its way, and, right? And and let it let it kind of spool out. Yeah. And then when you find out Shaw's story, it makes sense why he's so protective of his crew. Like you know, again, not spoiling, but. Like it just it all it all makes sense. Yeah, it's like he has to be this aloof, hard outer shell in order to muscle through his own trauma, muscle through his own pain, and see to it that what happened to him doesn't happen to other people. Obviously, there are people online who, as soon as we, they saw Shaw, they're like, oh, this guy's not going to be around for very long. You've probably seen the tweets and stuff. <laughs> what do you say to I'm that? Having bla- I'm having a blast with that. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, some people are like, he doesn't make it out of Act One. I'm like, well, you know, it, I mean, it stands to reason when you when you have these legacy characters and, and uh, I, I just, I, I, I just, and it, I, can, I get why they're saying it. Uh, I, I uh, ultimately, I, uh, I think they will be pleasantly surprised to come on the ride uh, and experience the journey of this character. And I think the beauty of this season is it's not Star Trek: The Next Generation. 
Mm -hmm. It's Star Trek Picard. It's its own show with that is that is bringing back these legacy characters, but there are also other characters that are part of Star Trek Picard. Rafi, myself, uh, uh, Ed, uh, Ed Spillier's character, uh, that that have their own arcs that are part of the Star Trek Season 3 Picard, uh, Star Trek Picard Season 3 story that aren't just about the legacy characters, but they all... Uh, it's all part of the big tapestry that makes this, and I think that's what makes that's what makes this not just a retread. That's what makes this an original story and fresh. Totally. Now, um, you know, obviously the next generation cast are really, really tight. That's legendary how tight they are, and they've been together for thirty five years. Jerry and Michelle have been in Picard in season one, yeah. so you and Ed and Ashley, like, were you guys like a little newbie club, or, or did you? It didn't feel cordoned off at all. It felt like we were all making this. In fact, one of my favorite stories that I've told uh, a couple of times is um, I uh, I was sitting there in the captain's chair and uh, we were in between setups and uh, Brent Spiner was on set because he was doing a makeup test. And he walked over and, and uh, Sir Patrick was sitting next to me and Brent came over, he's sort of playfully choking Patrick, and they're, they're having a little moment reunion. They hadn't seen each other. And then Patrick stands up and he goes, oh, Brent, have, have you met Todd Stashwick? And then he leans over to uh, all, both of us. He goes, he's one of us. <gasps> wow. I was, like, I was like, oh, okay. Okay. I can, I can just go home now. We're good. <laughs> uh, like, I was never treated, and nobody was. Again, the entire crew, everybody was treated like we are the family of this show. Everybody was honored. Everybody was treated. It wasn't like, we're the new cast, and this is the legacy cast. The legacy cast was us, and we were them. And it was uh, such a, uh, I get a little full, like a little, we're clamped thinking about it. We were... Uh, we made something special together. That's beautiful. But, but the thing is, you actually were already part of the uh, of the Star Trek family. You were in Star Trek I Enterprise. Was. I just, I, was. I just, I published an article about this yesterday. Do you have uh, what are your what are your memories about working on that set? Because you got to work with Scott Bakula and Jolene Blaylock. I did. And, I, and actually, my my dear friend uh, Kara Zedeker played Tapau. Yes. Uh, uh, just a chance to uh, step in and. Um, there was one moment, you know, I love to take moments uh, to just kind of soak in and appreciate uh, the opportunities that I've had in my life and in my career. I've had these moments because I'm also, like I said, I'm an I'm a 80s kid. I'm a Lucas Spielberg Star Trek kid. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to have these moments where I'm like, this is, this is, I have to appreciate this. And so I was there in my, in my Vulcan slash Romulan ears uh, with my, with my eyebrows in my silver jumpsuit with my lerpa and I'm like, I'm on Vulcan. I'm on Vulcan. I'm going to appreciate that right now. I'm not, this isn't Halloween. I'm not dressed up for a convention. Like I am, I am a, a Romulan. I am on Vulcan. I am now part of this legacy that came long before me and will go on long after me. And quite honestly, you know, I thought this was, I've, I've punched my Star Trek ticket. <laughs> and uh, that's wonderful. I have I have contributed to a canon that I find beloved, and uh, so I was satisfied. You know, uh, it was wonderful. And Scott Scott was great, and I got to work with him again on Men of a Certain Age. Mm -hmm. um, I've not seen uh, Jolene since then. I've seen Kara Zedeker since then. Uh, it uh, it was pretty special. It was pretty special then, uh, and so I never thought something could exceed that experience. Uh, and then the universe said, hold my beer. You've come full circle in Star Trek, and now you're back, you, and you're back at the highest level possible, and there's nothing bigger than Picard. It's not lost on me, like I said. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I was pretending to be a captain at six years old, <laughs> and now at 54, I'm, uh, I, I still got to pretend to be a captain. Obviously, you work with Terry on 12 Monkeys prior to, yeah. prior to Star Trek. So what, is he, what does Terry bring to Star Trek that Picard is maybe, maybe missing in prior seasons or, or you know, or... He really got I, to apply. I will, I will cast no aspersions on any other uh, any other version of Star Trek. I oh, think, me neither. Uh, I love that. I love those everyone. Seasons. Everyone. Uh, there is there is Star Trek for everyone. 
when I say Terry Metalis brings um, his heart and what moves him, I think what Terry does and what I uh, what I feel like uh, uh, any uh, any directors that I have responded to and creators and writers that I responded to, they want to deliver for an audience the things that they were inspired by when they first saw these things. So like mm -hmm. him being, I mean, I mean he's, but he was part of, he was part of DS9 and Voyager and Enterprise. And, uh, and he, uh, and he loves the Nicholas Meyer films and he loves the original series. And so I think what he brings is that want to go, I want to move an audience in the way that I was moved. And so these are the things that that I feel are essentially Star Trek. I think Terry's love of the, the kind of the pomp of um, the military aspect, the the rank, the the you know the just going from the boatsway and whistle, uh, introducing captains to the when, whenever we have you you feel the chain of command, you feel that that sort of regality of of. Starfleet, and I think he brings that. He also brings a tremendous sense of cinema. He wants it to be cinematically fun. Mm. Uh, these are space adventures. Yes, are they thoughtful polemics on the dynamics between hum humans? Of course they are. Uh, are they problems solved through science? Of course they are. Are they uh, shootouts with uh, phasers of course they are are they space battles of course they are so he wants you to get all of it he wants deep heartfelt moments between characters and he and he wants spectacular space battles like he wants all of it uh and and i think he uh he along with the entire uh writing staff and crew uh cinematographers makeup department everybody's heart we're in it and we knew the minute you read that first episode we were in for something special let's do a little bit of a like a, a coming up on star trek the card um what can you tease us about what's to come expect the unexpected there's some wonderful uh surprising cameos even um not just visual cameos but uh uh vocal cameos mm -hmm. Keep your ears peeled uh, for some vocal cameos. Uh, there's some. Uh, what else can I tease? You know what? I I don't want to give anything away other than say pop your popcorn, sit down, and it's a ten hour movie uh, mm -hmm. in the spirit of of you know. I I, I just rewatched Undiscovered Country. And, oh, I, I love it. And, and Wrath of Khan. And there's a, there's the. There's a feeling of that. This is like I feel like this is for the what what those films were to the uh, to the original cast. Uh, this is to the next gen cast. It has that spirit of because when the the next gen cast movies came out, they weren't really reunion movies. Yet. Right. They were just kind of extensions of what we had seen. Right. It was like mm -hmm. okay, let's take this universe and just sort of extend it onto the big screen. But now enough time has passed that bringing them back together gives you that feeling that you had when you saw Wrath of Khan or Undiscovered Country or Voyage Home or any of those. It gives you that, that warmth of, wow, this just feels good to see them again and to, and, and to learn what happened to them and to see that they still have tricks up their sleeve. 100% agreement. I really feel this is the best TNG movie. It's one of the best Star Trek movies, but it's also like a 10 hour epic. It's so it's deep. It's, it's, yeah. it's so respectful. It's respectful and it's, it's not a slavish Valentine. It's, um, it does, it does nod to the past, but it also, uh, it also looks forward and gives you new things. Uh, it gives you new characters. It gives yeah. you new experiences, new villains. Um, it's just uh, an Amanda Plummer, man. Oh, my, my last question for you is, um, are you ready to go to cons and see people cosplaying as Liam Shaw? <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's going to happen, but... Uh, oh, I I'll think it will. I'll just assume that they're Riker because I'll see uh, some, <laughs> some, some dude with a beard and go, oh, great Riker costume. Um, 
Um, I have been going to cons for you know the better part of the last uh, last uh, fifteen years, right? So I, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I have uh, I, I I am a a convention goer myself. So uh, the, the the ability to go with this uh, as a custodian of Star Trek uh, is very exciting. But that's very exciting to me to be able to represent uh, this show and, and 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 this little special moment in time that uh, I got to boldly go right. So it's uh, it, it's 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 an it's an honor and it's a it's a treat and and hopefully an opportunity to see these people that that I I got to work with uh, again. Um, it, it's like it's it, it's again those are those become family reunions. Uh, for me, and then to connect with the fans of the franchise, uh, being one of them, absolutely. Well, Todd, th- listen, thank you so much. I've got to let you go, but I want to thank, thank you for you, your Todd. time. This has been a really wonderful chat. Um, I love talking Star Trek with you. Oh um, gosh. we can do it all day, and, and I hope, uh, I hopefully I'll see you at the premiere. I'll be there on Thursday. Terrific, please say hello. I will, I will find you. I'll definitely come and seek you out. All right, cheers. <laughs>